Hello, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi, joined again, once again, by Jimmy Aiken. He's been on the channel a bunch. He's going to be on a lot more. But today we're reviewing a really interesting movie that came out in 2021. It's called Black Easter. I actually saw this. My wife sent me a, a TikTok about this movie, and it was basically this guy saying this really strange, weird Christian movie was made. He played some clips on his TikTok, and I was like, that's looks horrible. And so I was like, Let me, it might actually be fun to to do a video review on this, uh, just to kind of see like where Christian movies are, are at right now. And so I invited Jimmy to uh, watch it with me. So he did. And I did. And, um, the movie was surprisingly, I mean, it, it was kind of like what you would expect from a Christian movie. So there were elements that, for example, uh, bad acting. Okay. Bad acting was pretty much rampant throughout, but in a low budget film, you kind of expect that. And Jimmy, I think that you'd probably agree with that. And in, in a lot of low budget films, um, you're going to just be, you, you need to expect some bad acting, if not from like the main characters then the side characters for sure. Mm -hmm. But uh, so there, there was that, but the story was, um, it seemed pretty straightforward, but the way that they told it was, was actually really complex, surprisingly complex. Mm -hmm. And it, it, uh, I was expecting to be really bored with it. And I think that you were too, Jimmy, but um, as we watched it more and more, I was, I mean, at least I found myself like, this is actually like, I, I remember a lot of the story happening, like in the first 30 minutes of the film mm -hmm. that, uh, I, and, and I was looking at the time and I was like, there's still an hour left of this movie. Where are they going to go with this? Because so much has already happened in the first 30 minutes. So that was, that was really interesting. Um, but before we get into, uh, Jimmy, I'll pass it over to you in a second. I just want to let the audience know that if you'd like to watch this movie, it's called, again, it's called Black Easter. There's actually two versions of it. There was an earlier version, uh, a different cut. It was called what? 33, uh, Assassin 33 AD, something like that. Is that the right? Yeah. Assassin 33 AD. Um, that one apparently is not available. We couldn't really find that one to, to go and watch, but it was an earlier cut of the film basically. And then they made a new cut that was a little less, as, as they call it, as Islamophobic. And we'll, we'll get into those details uh, here in a little bit. But Black Easter is the one that you can find now. We watched it on Amazon, and then we found out that actually a couple weeks ago, the whole movie was posted on YouTube for free. So you guys can actually go click the description of this video and go watch the whole thing if you're interested. Um, what we're going to do in this video, though, is we're going to just be playing some clips of the movie and kind of talk about some of the things that happened, some of the interesting parts of it, some of the bad parts of it some of the funny parts of this movie which this is going to be a, a really fun stream but I, but part of it is to kind of see like what's going on in the christian movie culture right now is it getting worse is it getting better what's what's going on uh but jimmy uh it's, it's great to have you back yeah thank you so much um so i have to confess i don't really watch a lot of christian movies you know i've seen some i mean i've seen the passion of the christ and things like that but um i don't really watch a lot of them precisely because they tend to be amateurish and they tend to be heavy on the preaching rather than the plot and character dynamics and they tend to be kind of formulaic um, you know, Christian movies tend to be a little like I gather <laughs> romance novels are, you know, you're going to have someone whose faith is going to be challenged, but they're going to come, they're going to adopt the faith in the end. And, um, so I don't really watch a lot of Christian movies. What I am a fan of is bad movies. Uh, I watch loads of bad movies and they're, and, and I was making fun of them before mystery science theater even existed. So I have, a, a, an, I'm an aficionado of bad movies. I also am an aficionado of low budget movies. Uh, as you say, they can contain bad acting, but there's actually in recent years been a number of movies basically made for a few thousand dollars, you know, which is nothing in Hollywood terms that are actually astoundingly good with astoundingly good acting and character development and plotting. I'm all about plot. And um, so I've been impressed. And it's interesting to see where this one kind of falls on this scale. Um, I prepared a summary of it. Uh, would you like me to uh, read the plot synopsis of it so people will know what it involves? Yeah, let's do that. And, and I also wanted to, to note that if you guys are interested in watching the movie, so there's going to be some spoilers that we discussed today, but you can still, I think, get a lot out of it. Even if you watch this whole video and then you go watch the movie, you can, uh, you'd still get some good out of it, I suppose. Um, yeah. But I just wanted to let you guys know that there are going to be some spoilers that we discuss in the film today, but I think it'd still be good to, to give a sort of plot synopsis at the beginning uh, before we play these clips. So yeah, Jimmy, go ahead. 
Okay, so as we said, spoiler warning, this isn't going to cover everything in the movie, but it's going to cover the key points, just so people know what they're investing their time in if they want to watch it. It's the year 2029, and the smartest man in the world is a 20-something named Ram, Ram Goldstein. Uh, he's the smartest man since Einstein, and he openly tells us so. Uh, he gets a job working for a Muslim multimillionaire named Ahmed, who is paying Ram to invent stuff, including matter transportation. But it turns out Ahmed is working for the equivalent of Osama bin Laden, and he wants to use matter transportation to beam bombs and stuff around to facilitate terrorist operations, so high-tech terrorism. Uh, but Ram and his goofy lab friends uh, don't only invent matter transportation for him. They also invent time travel. And Ahmed decides to go back in time and kill Jesus before the crucifixion and wipe out Christianity. To do this, he sends a team led by a man named Brandt. Brandt is a Christian whose family recently died in a car crash, so he's really mad at God. On the film's first trip back to the past, Brandt kills Jesus, who hints that he's only allowing this to happen for a greater purpose. And this creates a nightmare apocalypse future with zombies. But Ram and his goofy lab buddies go back in time to save Jesus. And despite a bunch of time travel shenanigans, they actually managed to do that. In AD 33, Jesus is crucified on schedule, though Muslim terrorist Ahmed does time travel to Jesus's tomb and manages to get some of his DNA before he resurrects. Unfortunately for our heroes, things are far from over, because in addition to saving Jesus, they also need to save themselves from the horrible things Ahmed has done to them. For example, angry security guy Brant killed Ram Ram's girlfriend Amy, and on Jesus' instructions, if, if Ram wants to save Amy, he must genuinely forgive Brant. This leads to an emotional confrontation between Ram and an earlier version of Brant who hasn't killed anybody yet. The earlier version of Brandt is so broken up about his family's death that he actually begs Ram to kill him. But, heeding Jesus' words and wanting, wanting to save Amy, Ram does forgive him. Ahmed then tries to turn the tables on the two of them. Brandt is shot and paralyzed, so he'll spend the rest of his life in a wheelchair. But Ram gets the upper hand and kills Ahmed. However, there's still a version of Ram from an earlier timeline, and he goes back in time to save Brant's family, which will also save Brant from the wheelchair. He also slips his earlier self a note about how to make time travel work, and the earlier Ram uses this to get rich. Meanwhile, another version of Ram uses time travel to save another version of Amy by taking her to a hospital in the year 2059. The hospital can save her, but it turns out that the version of Ahmed that got Jesus' DNA also went to the future, and he used the DNA to clone a copy of Jesus that has miraculous powers, but the clone is also the Antichrist. The end. Yeah, crazy, crazy <clears throat> story, synopsis. It's, it, it, it is wild. Like I was saying, the first 30 minutes of the film, I was like, it seems like everything that I was expecting out of this movie, because in the title, I think in the subtitle, it's like, time travel to kill Jesus, something along those lines. And that's what you kind of expect when you go into this movie. You see like, uh, it's called Black Jesus, but it's supposed to be like a black ops operation, time travel into the past to kill Jesus. Black and you Easter. think it's like a, yeah, and you think that it's like a, you know, straightforward, just time travel, go to kill him and then kind of see what happens. But then it ended up just being this super complex storyline where there's earlier versions of people, later versions. And uh, that was what was really confusing to me to try to like pick those out. But it's, it is just wild. It's, it's a, a very crazy, strange film. It's not like a usual Christian film. There are some elements too, that you just wouldn't expect in a Christian well, film. The whole and killing Jesus early thing. And then the saving Jesus thing. You yeah, wouldn't expect either of those in a normal Christian movie. Yeah, and there's some other really uh, questionable, like theological things that that happen and, and go on in, in different parts of it when they interact with Jesus and stuff. We're gonna get to those clips. So if you guys are interested and, and want to just buckle up, maybe maybe go pop some popcorn. If you don't want to watch the uh, the full film uh, Black Easter, you can just kind of watch this one and, and get something out of it. So uh, let's get into some clips. So the first clip that we've got here is actually just the the, the opening of the film, which mm -hmm. Jimmy, you thought was important to kind of point out that they they highlight that they won some awards. But yeah. then you couldn't really like verify any of the awards that they won, right? Well, that's the spoiler. Um, yeah, so they they have right up at the front of the film in the opening credits 
a bunch of, you know, titles fly at us that talk about awards they've allegedly won. And so that's weird in and of itself to put a bunch of award claims at the, at the beginning of your movie. You know, most movies don't do that. Um, but it turns out that it's, at least it's been reported that nobody can verify that they won any of these awards. And that raises a question about the honesty of the production house and the producer, Jim Carroll. Um, if you're claiming you make, won a bunch of awards and they're all fake or you didn't win them, then you're not really being honest with the, with the moviegoers. And that's something that you, uh, uh, you would expect from a Hollywood film. You don't expect Hollywood to be honest. You know, I, 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 a number of years ago, I, I watched a biopic about a guy in the 19th century that a major Hollywood house had put out. I'll, I forget his name. I'll call him John Smith. But at the beginning, they've got a title card that says, based on the life of John Smith. Well, I'd, I knew about this 19th century figure and it, I said it should have been called based on the lies of John Smith because none of this stuff really <laughs> happened in his life. Similarly, if you look at the beginning of the movie Fargo, it says this is a true story in a title card, but that's a total lie. It's made up and you don't expect honest title cards from Hollywood, but you would expect honest titles from a Christian production. And so it really raises a question in my mind about how sincere is this production house? It's kind of weird because later in the movie, they're clearly intellectually engaged and trying to do a fundamentally positive message, but yet we have these dubious award claims right at the beginning. Yeah, the the movie actually kind of reminds some some elements of the movie reminded me of the uh, was it just called Noah the movie with Russell Crowe where he yeah. was 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 Noah? Yeah, they they took some creative liberties in in that as well, and I think he was trying to kind of like do some of that in this film, but. Yes. we can we can it's hard to know how like how how deep to go into this and how deep to like go investigate this production house but i i don't know how productive that would be you know so um let's just play this opening uh, scene here and just kind of look at some of these awards that uh that they allegedly won So many. <laughs> and they're going like too, almost too fast through them just to, to kind of almost so people don't pause it and look at them. Yeah. And they tend to, you know, none of these are famous at all. And there are even things like Calcutta, some, some Calcutta Film Award for Best Script. A lot of them would be hard to find in, you know, even if you went looking for them. And so that's part of why no one's been able to confirm that these awards were won much less as far as I know that they even existed. Yeah. Yeah. So that one's oh, kind uh, of a mystery to me. As we, as we kind of transition out to get into the film, there was uh, one, one thing that really stood out to me at the very beginning as a, as someone who does YouTube and I'm, I actually have a, a lot of audience probably doesn't know this, but I have a degree in audio production and that's what I, that's what I went into. I was a photographer before that and I was trying to decide as I was going into school, what do I want to do? Do I want to do photography or audio? Because I had a, a passion for audio at the church that I was attending. I was, you know, hanging out in the back and, and, and doing the audio for the church. And so I, I decided to do audio. I felt like that would be a, a better uh, expenditure of my money if I wanted to, to, to do audio professionally. But anyway, so I have a, a very decent knowledge of the way that audio works and frequencies and compression and all the different things that you can do to audio to make it sound good. And that, that was one of the things that really stood out to me is that they have this voiceover from the main actor throughout the film. It's very heavy at the beginning and then it, you kind of get it like in bits and pieces, especially toward the end, obviously, as they sort of wrap things up. Um, but it, I just noticed it. It almost sounded like they recorded it on an iPhone and then ran it through like an AI upscaler, like studio kind of thing that it, I actually use that every now and then in, in my videos. Uh, the, the pre-recorded stuff that we do. Um, if I have some really bad audio that I want to make sound better, there's some different AI programs you can use. Like Adobe's, I think is uh, one of the better ones. It's free as well, but it's, that's what, almost what it sounded like. It was, it was very, very poor 
quality. Very surprising to me that they couldn't have just gone out and bought, you know, three or $400 microphone and use that instead of, uh, whatever they ended up using to record it. Maybe they just didn't have, uh, very good editors either being able to, to, to make the audio sound good. That was, that was surprising to me. Even if you can't get like a good actor, you can still have like good quality audio at least. Oh yeah. Uh, but like they, they didn't manage to, to do that. Yeah, the most competent part of Plan 9 from Outer Space is the soundtrack. Everything else in Plan 9, which is often wrongly regarded as the worst movie ever, uh, there are far worse movies, um, but Plan 9 is often regarded as the worst movie ever because of how incompetent it, it is on every level <laughs> except the sound. The soundtrack <laughs> is actually good. Um, and in this, mm. I, the, 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 I think the sound qualities you're picking up on may be related to the production history of the film because mm. apparently a lot of the voiceovers, right. I don't know if all of them were, but a lot of the voiceovers got added when they did the re-edit, when they turned Assassin AD 33 into Black Easter, they added yeah. a bunch of, they cut material and then they used voiceovers to bridge what they cut. And it so seems they like have, they also did some reshoots as well. Yeah. They may have not had time to go back into a sound studio or something and do all the voiceovers. They may have just said, here, read this into my iPhone and we'll fix it in post. Yeah. Okay. So as I mentioned at the beginning of this, if you guys are just kind of catching up to us, th this is a movie that, that went through two different types of, uh, or two different cuts. So the original cut was one that I don't think a whole lot of people saw, but the blowback that they were receiving from it, it was basically, the claim was that it was very Islamophobic. And so they decided to do a another cut of the film that was a little bit nicer to the Muslim community. And we're going to, uh, to kind of get to some of those clips. I think we've got some pulled up that are all kind of exposed, like what's going on there, the, the kind of... It's really strange how they ended up doing that to, to make it more or less Islamophobic. But we'll, we'll get to that in a little bit. I just want to kind of highlight that as you guys are watching along. We're going to cover that uh, in due time. Let's get to this first clip. This first clip is about Ram and how he, Ram is the main character. He's the one who's like, you know, smarter than Einstein, apparently. Um, but yeah, he, it talks about how he's the greatest scientist since Einstein. So uh, let's go ahead and uh, and play this clip here. Is there anything else you want to say before we play this? No, clip? I was I was going to say you know you mentioned how bad the acting is, and and I'd also mention how cheesy the dialogue can be, especially in voiceovers. And he's also got cringe stuff here with his girlfriend Amy, who he's meeting for the first time, and it's a good. It, after watching this. When I, you know, went through the film, I thought, oh boy, this is going to be, you know, a couple of hours of this level of material. And I was really expecting to hate it, hate it, hate it. And so this will give you a taste of why I, and I think you can, really expected yes. to find this an awful, awful film without redeeming qualities. I was losing interest by the second as this movie started. And then as you said, like, and then things started happening and I was like, where are they going with this? Mm -hmm. So yeah, let, but let's start this, uh, this beginning clip here. That's me, Ram Goldstein, the most brilliant genius since Einstein. I'm not bragging. It's just fact. My story is a little hard to follow for even the most avid time traveler fans, but don't be disheartened. I'll help you follow along. When two quantum objects, photons, share the same wave functions and occupy the same space and time, they are identical. And what happens to one in theory would happen to the other. Yes. Oh, sorry. Sorry. It's okay. That's Amy. She's a genius, too. It was love at first sight. Stay. OK, well, at least it was for one of us. Back to Amy. We actually fell in love in my basement. I won her over with my flair for fashion, incredibly good looks, and my dancing skills. I'm really sorry. I get hyper-focused and sometimes self-absorbed. I get it. That might have been the toughest test I've ever taken. Pretty sure I aced it? No one's ever going to ace this test. I'll be the first. Oh, really? And just who are you? Ram Goldstein. Amy Lee. If you're so brilliantly smart, how come I've never heard of you? 
I graduated MIT over five years ago. I do contract work out of my basement. So you live with your parents? <laughs> well, it's kind of like a uh, financial arrangement. Um, more like they live with me. Okay. Yeah, so lots, <laughs> lots of cringe in that. Um, <laughs> On multiple levels. Multiple yeah. levels. Not just yeah. in the story and what they're trying to... to uh, yeah, it's so bad. And the, and the way that they tell the story here is also just really bad because they yeah it, yeah they're they start doing it with like bumpy they're doing tell don't show yeah they bump, they, they bump into the, sorry i keep cutting you off go ahead that's okay instead of instead of illustrating how smart he is they you know in an effective way they they just hit us over the head telling us that explicitly i'm the smartest guy since einstein oh and she's a genius too and we're going to meet two more goofy geniuses coming up um, and it's, it, the dialogue is just really cringeworthy. The acting isn't great. Uh, the actress playing Amy has an incredible amount of vocal fry that she's using. And, um, yeah, that's my reaction. Anyway, I was hating this more and more by the second. Yeah. My, my daughter is in, uh, is in theater and she does mm -hmm. a lot of, uh, plays and everything and and I work with her. I actually did theater as well when I was uh when I was young and in school and stuff. But she loves it. Yeah. She loves acting and, and she even wants to be an actress when she's when she's older. So we have her in theater right now just to to see if she wants to to keep up with it. But the reason why I'm bringing that up is because like and this is not just like a, a proud dad. Like I I'm I'm very proud of her, but she's also she's a legitimately good actress. And like she could act circles around uh this this actress here i don't i don't know what her her real name is but it was yeah seeing this for the first time it just like like you say just lowered my expectations they they were already pretty low but then when i saw her begin to act it just it lowered them even further but then yeah. like the interactions between them just didn't even seem like who who is writing these sort of interactions like you just accidentally bump into someone and they they turn around and she says stop right there like this is supposedly the first time that they interact and stuff that's not a real human interaction at all mm -hmm. you know it's just uh that, that kind of stuff i feel like people should be able to pick up on these kinds of things or or, or who is writing these sorts of films i mean like i said we, we mentioned this at the beginning like the, the story develops it gets super weird and interesting and there's all sorts of like interesting things that that happen in this movie that are just very surprising but then again, like there's stuff like this that just seems so basic, like create, just, just create some natural dialogue. It's, it's not that difficult. I think a lot of people that, that aren't even movie writers could, could do it, but yeah. Uh, any other thoughts on, uh, this clip before we move to, uh, to the next one? No, I just say that, um, you know, in the TikTok where you had uh, encountered this film first, it was touting it as the worst Christian movie ever made. And so when I watched this scene, it kind of played into that narrative because of how bad this scene is. But um, I, I don't think this is the worst Christian movie ever made. I, I can't name a worse one off the top of my head, but I'm sure they exist. I would say this is the weirdest Christian movie ever made yeah probably yeah by a long shot. I, I thought i thought the same as i was beginning to watch and, and also based on the tiktok that my wife sent me i was expecting it to be super bad and there obviously are bad elements but then it just there's some redeeming qualities that it has we'll, we'll get to more of those Let, let's go ahead and move to uh the next let's, clip so where we meet his where we meet ram's genius team and the colorful characters they are who were just told are geniuses yeah and there's a lot of elements in the film that are like supposed, like obviously taken from other successful movies, and they try to to make sense of it in in this film and stuff, like the the introducing of the new characters. Um, but yeah, just it, it just doesn't work on on uh, the level that it needs to. Well, let's watch this clip. It took them three months to make the announcement, but we're finally famous. Oh yeah, about time somebody recognized my greatness. You mean besides yourself? That's Simon. He's my best genius friend. He's funny and cool, but his attitude gets us into a lot of trouble. There's a picture. They made me high happy. That's Felix. He's your stereotype genius. He even carries around a stuffed penguin called Happy. This is that's that's what uh, scientists and geniuses do, right? Yeah, lab coats and carrying around stuffed penguins. I guess that's what they're famous for. <laughs> that's a common stereotype. 
Uh, yeah, and then the other guy, like Simon, is supposed to be. He says in the narration that he gets him in trouble all the time. He he kind of uh, doesn't do that in this film, but uh, no, he actually has a pivotal role, and he's more on the ball than uh, than Ram is. Yeah, yeah, which is weird. Um, all right, let, let me uh, finish this one out. So only another like 10, 20 seconds. It's going to look great on our resumes. We won't be needing resumes if we can't get this completed. How about getting back to work? Ram, if you're the smartest dude in the world, how come you can't figure out that we just need to chill out every now Simon, and then? Simon, can you focus for just a few minutes? I really need to test this algorithm. You are- yeah, okay. I hate the dialogue, hate the acting there. Yeah. Oh, one thing I wanted to to comment on is that the I feel like the scene or the uh, locations that they that they got for this movie I, they're not mm-hmm. terrible. Like some of no, them are, are decent. Like the set design is is okay for the budget, but mm-hmm. yeah, it's not terrible. Like they they had a good location scout that was able to to go out and find locations to to use for the film. So I thought like that that's one positive thing for this mm-hmm. film because some some you know it, it almost looks like they're they're filming in like you know like literally a high school hallway or classroom and stuff sometimes in, in some low budget movies, but this one looks like it's, uh, they, they, they got some good locations. So, so kudos to them on, on that one. All right, let's move to the next one. I'm, I'm having fun, Jimmy. We, we talked about like how many of these clips we're going to play. Let's just play all of them. How about okay. that? Okay. Sounds good. We'll get through, we'll get through as many until we, until we start getting bored, which, mm-hmm. uh, I, I don't feel myself getting bored. So hopefully the, the audience is, is having a good time watching this as well. So, all right. Yeah. Uh, next clip, seven thirty, seventeen thirty six. Oh, Let me just. Yeah, this one. This one is very interesting. You wouldn't expect yes. to see this scene in a Christian film. This is, this is one place it starts getting weird. Yeah, let's just play this one. I'm not going to set it up anymore. Uh, this is a lot harder than I thought. It's only been a few weeks. Don't be so hard on yourself. You know, I think I might know the problem. Come look at this. Okay, real quick, let's introduce these guys. So these guys are watching them because they're... Mm -hmm. Uh, starting to uh, has it already happened yeah it's already happened at this point where they're starting to get suspicious of the scientists because they want them to do things for them but i think has has ram already kind of discovered no that's the next no not yet in in in, at this point i think the reason that this scene exists is to establish that the higher ups are now watching them okay and because there's no other plot function for this scene um Mm -hmm. And this is just to show us they're being watched. And actually, the surveillance is a big part of what happens yeah. in the movie. Yeah, I just wanted to to mention that because we're we're seeing that on the on the the, the film right now. So uh, that that's kind of what's going on. All right. Hey, hey. What is he doing? Working in the server room is my favorite part of the day. So this is work. Don't twist my words. You know what I mean? Yeah. (laughs) So don't expect, didn't expect a uh, heavy flirtation, petting, face sucking scene in a Christian movie here, but uh, with, with playful banter, lascivious dialogue. Yeah. Just, just kind of randomly. Like it doesn't really serve uh, Mm -hmm. any other purpose. It, It is very, curious for a you know quote unquote christian film that yeah. was one of the reasons why i wanted to ask you earlier uh, before mm-hmm. we went live uh, the the producer what is his name carol uh jim carroll i believe yeah jim carroll well, yeah what what other movies has he done is he is, is he exclusively made christian films or has he done other types of films um well he's, very curious he's, He's done other things. He's credited with four films on IMDb, although one of them looks like it's an episode of a TV series. It's called Marriage Boot Camp Reality Stars, and he apparently did something with that. But then there, are th- he's credited with three other movies, but one of them is Assassin 33 AD, which is just the earlier cut of Black Easter. So really, right. it's two a tv show and two films one of them being black easter and the other being the evil behind you 
which came out all the way back in 2006. So he had a he had a, a pretty big trough. He Black Assassin and Black Easter didn't come out until 2020 and 2021. So he had a kind of a dry spell for a long period there. Um, the the movie The Evil Behind You IMDb summary says abducted couples are victims of medical experiments that mutate their minds with supernatural abilities. As their mental capacities increase, so does the danger from something evil that is not of flesh and blood. And so that sounds like it could be, um, you know, another Christian thing, kind of combining science fiction and and um, and demons and stuff. If there's a an evil not of flesh and blood, uh, but I don't know. I'd have to. I haven't yeah. watched the other one. Yeah, but but nevertheless, the the point is that just to highlight that this is a an interesting weird scene to include yeah. in a you know quote unquote Christian film. From so, a from a right. plot from a plot dynamics perspective, I think the reason it exists is to do two things. Um, it's to to show us that they're being surveilled, and it shows us how they get out of the surveillance in this case, so that they can make an important discovery without their higher ups knowing that they've made the discovery. Mm, so that's yeah, that's what, what we're about to turn to. That's what that's the very next thing we see. Yeah, and it, it may also serve the point of showing that they are like you know in love. That that's yeah. important. Is it's important plot line to to show the love between the two of them because it, yeah, it's it's just important. It'll be important movie. later that that they love each other. Yes. Okay. Uh, let's play the next clip. So this one, uh, just about thirty seconds later. Someone's using a secure line to communicate with the outside. I'm gonna find out who. Oh my gosh. That's Rashad Amir. Rashad Amir is the most wanted terrorist in the world. He orchestrated the attack of 12 embassies in one day. We can use it in its current state, but it's not stable. How is the situation with the American? He's under control. <coughs> Everything explodes when you transfer it. Isn't that what we want? Yes, but if these kids keep doing their job, it won't be long before we can transfer supplies, bombs, and more. We can strike any GPS coordinate. Yeah, so this guy there with the turban is, or the head covering, is instantly recognizable to people all over the world as like the world's greatest terrorist leader. So he's basically a cipher for Osama bin Laden. And this is where they learn that their boss, Ahmed, who up to now has been really nice to them, you know, I mean, he's given them this fancy lab when they blow the fancy lab up with one of their matter transportation experiments. He's delighted because they actually got results. He gives them a better lab. And so he's been super nice to them up to now. But now we suddenly learn that he's he's in league with terrorists. And it's weird because when they tell us Ahmed's backstory, his his parents were actually killed by terrorists and he hated them but he seems to have gotten a case of stockholm syndrome where the the victim of a crime comes to sympathize with the per perpetrator of the crime and so he's now become a, a terrorist facilitator himself yeah it's interesting how the way that they actually told that because they they, they do uh, a lot of exposition in this film so they just basically tell you exactly what's going on that was what was happening at the very beginning of the film just telling us that Ram is a genius instead of, as Jimmy said, they could have created some sort of scene that showed how brilliant he was, but instead they just told you. And they, they kind of did the same thing with the, the whole Stockholm syndrome thing where Ram, I think just uh, sort of guesses that that's what he's, that that's what's going on. And, and apparently I suppose uh, that, that is supposed to imply that that's actually what's going on. But um, yeah, there's, there's a lot of exposition in this film and that is, it can be a downside, right? You want to, if you can be able to tell a story as opposed to just like throwing a lot of exposition, exposition or explaining the plot to the audience, uh, just in a bunch of words. And, and that, that's a, a credit, a, a fair criticism, I think of, of movies in general. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it, it's, it's actually one of the biggest criticisms of the Marvel films, uh, from what I understand is that there's, there's a lot of exposition in those films as opposed to just straight up storytelling. So, mm -hmm. Um, all right. Yeah. Next so, clip. Is, go ahead. So, so now that they've invented matter transportation, Ram, even though everything blows up when you transport it, uh, Ram goes on to invent time travel. 
and with, related to his matter transportation experiments. And as soon as, as Ahmed, the boss, learns about the time travel, he comes up with this plan to destroy Christianity. And that's where that's what our next clip is about. And this is, I think, one of the sources of the controversy of the of the the film. We yeah, don't we most, again we haven't most seen controversy. We have not seen the original cut, so we don't know what this looked like in the original, but uh, this is what it looks like now. You're still mad at God for your wife and family, right? Yeah, so if uh, that's not obvious, that's Brant. That's the guy that we mentioned yeah. in the plot summary who lost his family. This is like his lead sort of, uh, the, Ahmed's lead security officer. And yeah, he also he's, apparently is like, a, he's in the military, so he's able to, to go in and, and do this operation. Yeah, he's apparently got a military background, but he's working as either the head or one of the two heads of Ahmed's security forces for his facility. And he's only just come back to work after grieving for his wife and, and family that died in a car crash that he survived. So he's also got survivor's guilt in everything, mm -hmm. in addition to everything else. And so he's very mad at God now, and Ahmed is going to play on that. I should also mention... That I, I think he was actually the best actor in the film. There are some, uh -huh. cr there's some cringy, uh, cringy moments with him in terms of his acting, but I think mm -hmm. overall, in comparison to the other actors, I think he was the best. There were there were some moments where I was like, he's like genuine, like I can see emotion on his face. It looks real, and so it just seemed like he was uh, the one that was most sort of tapped in to his character uh, than, I can, than some of the others. I so. I, I can see that. Um, unfortunately, he's unhappy for most of the movie, but yeah. uh, but he does have some complexity. The one that I initially thought was going to be the worst actor was the, the gentleman who plays Simon, uh, Rom's best friend. And he has this unusual childlike affect when he speaks. And I, at first, I thought that was going to be really off-putting. And, and, you know, sound, he sounds like an amateur and a teenager and stuff like that. But actually, as it goes along, I think he's, I think he, if he's not a good actor, I think he ultimately was well cast for the part that they wrote him mm -hmm. because that, that kind of, that allows him to do some stuff with humor and even with pathos later on. Um, that is very interesting. So even though he's, I don't think he has a broad range as an actor, I think he was well cast for this specific part, given how it was written. Yeah. The only thing that I would say about that is that he, he didn't seem like a scientist at all. No, you know? so he no was, totally not like a scientist at all. Yeah. Yeah. He doesn't even have a stuffed penguin he's carrying around. I mean, come on <laughs> realism. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, no, he he's he seems like he would just be one of Ram's like childhood friends as opposed yeah. to a, like, a brilliant scientist who just happens to also have like a quirky character. You know, yeah. he's he's more just like a funny guy. It, and, for a point uh, of yeah. comparison, look at the if you've ever seen the Big Bang Theory, um the four main characters on the Big Bang Theory do come across as scientists, even though they have goofy personalities. And um you know, Raj Kutrapali and, and Howard and uh, Sheldon and Leonard, you know, they, they all come across, even though they're actors, they come across and they're written like scientists. So they talk about science things and, and make, actually they had a physicist help write jokes for the show. Um, mm. But, uh, but they can, they can pull off that mix of seems like they're a scientist, but also is a quirky character. Simon just comes across as quirky character. He doesn't yeah, come across and as a scientist. Since you guys, I think you only saw him on the screen for a second. We'll, we're actually going to play a longer scene with him in a little bit, but he's yeah. uh, the the black scientist that didn't have the the penguin. We only showed him for a few seconds, but we'll we'll get more of him throughout the. He'll be back. He'll be back. <laughs> All right, let's uh, let's continue this clip. I just wanted to point that out. This is Brant. All right. Yeah, I have the perfect mission for you. You're mad at Jesus, but wouldn't it be great to know if he was the real deal or just a myth? And how would you prove that? Prepare a full combat team and let me enlighten you.
take a break. You two stay here. Don't be judgmental or hating on Muslims. Ahmed is an extremist. There's a big difference. We can So awkward. <laughs> so awkward. And notice the don't be hating on Muslims. That's in a voiceover. That's undoubtedly one of the things they added. Yeah. It, it, like I, I think I was mentioning to the uh, this to you on the phone earlier that it seems like the some of the dialogue that they wrote for the voiceover to to kind of like make it less Islamophobic was almost like the producer was mad at the fact that he had to do this and so he wrote it he wrote this dialogue or this voiceover in like the worst cheesiest way possible just to like kind of get back at the people that were wanting him to to do this so it was like. I mean, let me actually rewind and, and play you, this one more time. It's just so you're bad. Given the, you're giving the writer-director a huge amount of credit given the other goofy stuff he writes. <laughs> Don't be hating on Muslims. Take a break. You two stay here. Don't be judgmental or hating on Muslims. Ahmed is an extremist. There's a big difference. See, and I also expect there to be like more dial, more voice over here to explain it a little bit further, but it just stops. Like, yeah. And then, and then there's just like empty, empty space right here as we're waiting for like the next dialogue to happen. Just, uh, yeah. 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 It's, they haven't really, I mean, they gave us a scene where Ahmed is, is talking to Osama bin Laden, but, and yeah, I guess you can infer he's an extremist on that basis, but we haven't been told anything about what he believes as an extremist, yeah. you know, what are his goals? What are his, what, you know, Muslim terrorists have beliefs that shape what their goals and what they're trying to do. And not all Muslim terrorists act the same because they come from different sets with different belief systems. And this is another aspect, which I, th I think the film tries to get right. Um, because as soon as he pitches this plan, which is essentially, he's going to send Brant back in time to kill Christ, before the crucifixion so that Christianity never happens. Um, and that will prove that he was, he was not divine. Um, this plot makes no sense from a Muslim perspective. And they try to address that in the film. In, in fact, one of the characters even says, this doesn't make any sense. Why would they do that? Muslims regard Jesus as a prophet. And they have other Muslims who give, um, who give Ahmed pushback saying, but you can't do that. The Jesus is a prophet will be condemned if mm -hmm. we harm a prophet. And okay. Yeah. And, and actually Ahmed says, well, no, actually we're going to, we're going to be rewarded because we're doing a good for, for God by, by revealing the truth here. And, but the other, it, Muslim, doesn't he say Muslim that this is a way to like honor Jesus or something along those lines? Yeah. Yeah. And none of that's, I mean, that's rationalization, but okay, he's a terrorist. Maybe he's rationalizing it that way, but why it really doesn't make sense for, uh, for, from a Muslim perspective is Muslims don't believe Christ died on the cross. So if you wanted to do anything as a Muslim to undo Christianity, which would be a problematic thing in itself because of the influence of Christianity on Islamic history. But if even if you wanted to, the thing wouldn't be kill him before the cross because they don't think he died on the cross. They think it was a twin or it was an illusion or something like that. And so you'd want to go back in time and save Jesus from the cross and make it obvious to everybody he didn't die on the cross. So it just it doesn't make sense from a Muslim perspective on multiple levels. Yeah, that would make more sense is just to to get him off of the cross as opposed to letting him die there. So saving, yeah, saving him would would be a much more consistent thing to do from within a Muslim framework. But um, I, I wanted to mention that it just seems like a very strange storyline. Like you, you, the story, of th the overall story is supposed to be they invent tri time travel to go kill Jesus. Okay, that's like the whole like shebang. That's what the movie is about. There's a lot of different ways you could get there, different motivations you could give people to want to go do that. But the way the the, the one that they chose that it's Muslims that want to go do that, it th that's just like a it almost seems like he's just wanting to to narrow in and, and say something bad about Muslims. And then mm -hmm. because of that first cut, then they have like people uh, gave gave pushback on it and so he he did a different cut and mm -hmm. just just like did the bare necessity in order to basically be able to publish the film 
publicly and not get a bunch of blowback from it. But it just it, it overall just seems like a really weird way to get the story to work, right? It just, yeah. I, I think we've we're kind of highlighting that. So yeah, yeah, weird. It's also this is the weirdest thing in the whole movie is time travel's just been invented. Your first thought is let's go use it to kill Jesus. I mean, to have that as the premise of a Christian movie, that qualifies this as the weirdest Christian movie ever made. <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the other characters is like, what if you could go back in time and kill Hitler? Maybe it was Ram that actually said that. And like, that would make more sense for someone who wants to travel back in time and kill somebody would be to go kill Hitler as opposed to going back and killing Jesus, who helped a bunch of people and was just overall a nice guy and, and transformed the world into be a better place. Yeah. There, have, so, there have been innumerable time travel stories written about going back to kill Hitler and the debates about do, can you kill him as a child or what. Mm -hmm. But it's that's actually a regular trope in science fiction. There's even a Doctor Who episode called Let's Kill Hitler. And in the Let's Kill Hitler episode, Doctor Who meets a young woman who is kind of muscling her way into his time machine with a gun. And um, he's like, who are you? What should, what are you, what do you want to do? Why are you coming in here? And she's like, well, look, I've got a gun. You've got a time machine. Let's kill Hitler. <laughs> and it's like, that's the obvious person to kill. One other thing I want to talk about, and maybe I'll actually bring it up later. There's something I wanted to discuss with you on just the whole topic of time travel mm -hmm. and, and the logistics of it, how it I, might actually work, which I don't think a lot of people take into consideration but I'll, I'll, I'll maybe bring that up once uh we find a scene here that's more explicitly about the time travel section so yeah. uh let's continue this clip here i think we've got like another 30 seconds of this one we can't kill him jesus is a prophet we should honor him yes and that's what we will be doing when he died his disciples created the resurrection myth which gave birth to christianity we can correct that but if we kill him we'll all be cursed just the opposite allah would honor us we will be correcting the greatest deception of all time. He will be remembered as a great prophet, but not as a son of God. Jesus would want that. And we will be effectively dismantling Christianity. If we get cut, we are going to be so... F there you go. So it basically, yeah. we, we kind of mentioned all that, that already, so... But that just basically can... But it shows it. they are trying to make sense of it from a Muslim perspective, and they're not simply portraying yeah. Muslims as unilaterally bad pe or uniformly bad people. So then they've got to actually go do the mission. And this happens, yep. as, as you can tell by the red line at the bottom of the YouTube screen, this is only a third of the way into the film when they, when they kill Jesus. This is the end of Act 1. And I thought it was important to, to have this clip because it, it just... It, because it shows you what the filmmakers were wanting and willing to put on film in a Christian film and mm. how bizarre it is. So uh, as we get into this one, I think you're going to kind of see like some of the costumes in, in this film uh, a, little, a little bit more explicitly because in the past it's just been like people wearing, you know, contemporary clothing but this you've got people dressed in these sort of special ops outfits with night vision goggles and guns and you're also going to see roman soldiers and people dressed in first century garb and stuff and uh the the first century garb i think is is okay but the roman soldier outfits are t like basically they bought them on amazon it's so bad um, and i don't and then think the they're even meant, i don't think they're even meant to be romans i think they're confused about are these supposed to be roman guards or jewish guards yeah it's it's horrible the costume so i i, I said some some nice things about the Location scouting, but the costume design in this uh, movie is terrible, especially with the black ops guys. Like, it looks like they just went out to Walmart, bought some black clothes, and, like, fashioned some straps to wrap around their chest or whatever, uh, and bought some helmets on, on Amazon and put some little th gadgets on them. Yeah. Uh, let's watch this one. <laughs> so there's Judas. Target verified. Three, two, one, engage. There's Jesus. I've got him. Kill the rest. 
if you really are the son of God, you can stop these bullets. Unless I allow it. No. You are not giving me your life. I am taking it from you. I have already died for you. Do what you must do. This is for taking my family. Bagging. See, de decent acting from Brant. Like, de yeah. like, decent. Not bad. Not yeah. bad. The Jesus Not character, meh. He's, 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 he's all right. But um, <laughs> I know the Jesus one thing, actor is not the best. Yeah. One, one thing I, I did want to point out that you guys seeing this for the first time, you're probably like, well, why was Jesus speaking English? We're going to get to a clip of that sort of explains that. So, in fact, I think uh, at the end tuned. of this, I think at the end of this clip, that issue gets raised. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think we've got another 10 seconds. Leave the arm with the time retriever hanging out. Did you just speak English? In 33 AD. Don't be a moron. Yeah. Yeah. So English didn't exist before about, and even this English wasn't, wouldn't be intelligible to us today, but English didn't exist before about AD 800. So Jesus speaking English, uh, 800 years before it should exist is a clue that they bring up in the film to there really is something supernatural about Jesus. He's, he's not just an ordinary man. He's speaking a language that won't exist for 800 years in its earliest version. So, mm -hmm. um, so the movie, unlike Stargate, unlike Stargate Atlantis, where everyone they meet speaks English, um, they're conscious of the fact that Jesus should not be speaking English here. And, and this, this will come up again as we go through. What I thought was interesting about this scene is the bizarreness of having a military commando hit squad kill Jesus at night in a Christian movie is you'll also notice they frequently cut away to black. They did it a couple mm -hmm. of times in this, and we just hear gunfire when it cuts to black, like when Brant actually shoots Jesus, it cuts to black and we just hear the shot. And that's some kind of deference. We see actually see something later when we witness the way of the cross and Jesus is struggling to carry the cross and a Roman or Jewish soldier strikes him to the ground and they cut to black there too. And those, those cut to blacks are obvious deferences to Christian sensibilities because they want Christians to see this film. I mean, that's the target audience. And if you get too bloody and too violent with Jesus and you're not doing the passion of the Christ, then it's going to come across as irreverent. And so they don't want that. And so they use these cuts to black strategically. What I wonder is were the cuts to black in the original version of the film or have they been added because of the pushback they got? Hmm. Interesting question. Good, good question. There was something else I was going to bring up. I can't remember it, but let's move on to the next clip, which is the the zombie future. Man, this one was just. Yeah. Whew. This also gets us into their theory of how time travel works. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I, I was just going to mention, I, I thought it was an interesting element how they had Jesus speak English. I thought mm -hmm. that was a really clever, like, thing to add in um but the way that they explained it just didn't or, or attempted to explain it, it just it was uh to me it was really bad we'll, we'll, there's a there's a clip where that kind of happens so we'll get yeah. to it in a little bit um but yeah th i thought it was it was pretty clever to to try to add that in there so uh, i like how they had him do it and and at first you unless you're a nitpicker like i am you may not realize yeah. he, why is he speaking english and then it occurs to the characters after the fact. And it's so it's not something that, whose significance is immediately on the characters. Mm -hmm. Oh, so one thing that one thing that you, I guess the audience needs to understand about this clip is that they kind of explain time travel. Like if you go back in time, you change something, then it mm -hmm. takes time, like literally to, like right. seconds. And yeah, for, for yeah that, that timeline to transition to like what it would be when that 
event would have taken place or yeah i don't know if i described that correctly maybe you can do a better job yeah no this is essentially back to the future time travel where even though in back to the future marty mcfly accidentally breaks his parents up in 1955 it takes time for that effect to ripple forward to 1985 which they symbolize in the movie by him looking at a picture of him and his brother and sister and like his old his oldest sibling vanishes from the picture first then his next oldest sibling vanishes because their birthdays are being erased as the change moves forward into the future and then marty mcfly's own um body starts to fade out of existence beginning with the legs for some reason and then he's able to get his parents back together and suddenly everything's back so it it has this idea that time takes it takes time for time ripples to ripple through time which yeah. makes no sense from a physics perspective if you create an alternate timeline bam it's there um yeah but but that's a common trope not just in this movie but other movies like back to the future and sometimes in doctor who yeah and you've got to give the a chance for the characters to go in and try to fix things i suppose so yeah yeah but, but from a physics perspective uh it doesn't make a ton so, of sense so in this clip, uh, Jesus has been killed, and some of our heroes have busted out of the lab and witnessed this killing. And this is Felix, the penguin-carrying scientist, who has now gotten back to the future, um, and he's been captured. Really, no. Time travel. There's the ripples. Oh man, it started. What is this? What started? Your men went back in time and killed Jesus and his disciples. Liar! We did not do this. Yes, you did. Now the timeline is overriding itself. This is your world. This can't be right. The world that you created. A world without forgiveness. So strange. Yeah. <laughs> but if you're gonna and have the an apocalyptic they... if you're gonna have an apocalyptic hellscape, you may as well throw in zombies. Yeah. <laughs> Throwing zombies, throwing like dilapidated buildings and stuff. Like, how did the buildings get there in the first place? So they they obviously had like some success, and then things went south, like south. You know, in, in like what the the late nineteen nineties or something along those lines. Like, how do we get to the point of being able to build buildings if there was if it was so destructive in the first place? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, and then and then why it, did people? Would, yeah, the line "a world without forgiveness" is a little too on the nose for me, and. However, that played out in this timeline, it obviously allowed for some success for a significant period before the absence of forgiveness doomed everything. Yeah, right. Just so strange. All right, let's let's finish out this. Game. They've apparently got helicopters here too. This is like the Matrix. It's also green. And unfortunately, this version of Felix dies, and we never hear any more from him. That's yeah, his exit yeah, he, from he the gone, film. he gone. Yeah, <laughs> but there, there are other versions of Felix, though. They, they had to just be like sitting there writing the story, and they're like, "What would be? Uh, how should this? How should you know? How should this one end? Let's just, ha dude, let's just do some zombies. Let's like have an apocalyptic future. Like, there's gonna be buildings blown up and." It's going to be green and dark and he like can, can barely breathe. And, and then we're just going to have zombies eat him. Yeah. That'd be, and, that, and then they that just... provides narrative closure for his character. And it's, it, it does. So responding to an itch, you know, people like zombie apocalypses. Yeah. And it's kind of like, if you have a movie with cavemen, you might as well throw in dinosaurs. Even yeah. if it may, may, may not make sense, but it'll be fun for the audience. And I think they also probably were trying to cater to, to Christians and be like, what would Christians love to see if Jesus were to have been wiped out before the crucifixion slash resurrection? Mm -hmm. They want to see the world just go to crap, 
You know, yeah. they want to see everything as bad as possible. So let's do that. Let's just make it as bad as possible. And then this is just add in zombies. We're already in this fan, uh, this fantasy world. Let's just go ahead and throw in some zombies coming out of the ground. Yeah. So this is, this is kind of the anti Shire, you know, in, in the Lord of the Rings movies, they begin with at the beginning of fellowship of the ring with a, a kind of extended C scenario with the Shire. So we get to see how hobbits naturally live before all the bad stuff happens. And what that does narratively is it shows us what we're fighting for. We want to get back to a situation where things like the Shire can exist and Sauron mm -hmm. will not be dominating the world with his evil and ripping up trees and stuff. Well, what we've just seen here is the anti-Shire. This is the thing. We're halfway through the film now. Jesus has been killed prematurely, and now we've seen the anti-Shire. This is the thing we want to avoid. Yes. And so now it motivates us to our heroes to try to fix things. And this scene here with Simon is, this is a bit of a longer clip, but it's really the theological and intellectual core of the movie. It's also where the movie really got interesting for me. Up to now, like that huge cringe line, a world without forgiveness. I mean, I was expecting to hate stuff. And, but then this is where it starts to turn around. So Simon has a time retrieval bracelet that he's trying to wear, that he's wearing. He's going to try to get back to the future with it, but it's going to short out on him and take him someplace he doesn't expect. Yes. And uh, we should also just, I guess, briefly mention that the reason why those exist is to be a, so that they can travel back and forth between time. They try to explain it by saying like, if they don't have it, then their molecules will will explode. explode is that what they yeah yeah um, that was their initial problem with matter transmission is whatever they transported would blow up and so th so ram invented the stabilizer thing so they can travel through time without blowing up which is just a watch basically with some little lights yeah. on it some little led lights on it but yeah so this is simon as we mentioned earlier and this is uh as you say, this is where things start to get interesting. Now, this, is, this is about a five-minute clip. We are going to have to cut it up just a little bit and, yeah. and comment as we go along just because we don't want to get copyright stuff. So uh, let's start this one, though. Oh. Ah! No. Oh. Ah, ah. Ah. I did also want to mention that, that that title that you saw earlier there, like mm -hmm. that, that, that same type of title is shown throughout the film, and it's... Really, really annoying. Low, really low those, quality. Yeah. Those sparkles that fly off. I mean, if you if they want to put a gold title on the screen to tell me where we are, fine. But having it disintegrate into gold sparkles that then blow off every single time, every time. it's really old. <laughs> yeah. It's fun like maybe once, and then you just and then just throw up like where they are in the timeline, you know, instead of uh yeah, having those super drawn out animations. <sighs> Hey, uh, are you okay? I'm Abba Liekhoka. Uh, no speak old Greek old? Has my father sent you? So okay. here, Jesus, this is actually, this actually corresponds to what some contemporary theologians have suggested, um, including um, Hansers von Balthasar and uh, Joseph Ratzinger, that Jesus, in obviously he's omniscient in his divine intellect, because he can't fail to be omniscient in his divine intellect. But a human intellect, by everyone has always agreed, is finite. And so there's a question of how much, even Aquinas would say Christ's human intellect was finite. So there's a question of how much supernatural knowledge was transferred into Christ's human intellect. And Aquinas had a very expansive view of what he thought, but more recent theologians like von Balthasar have essentially proposed it was mission-focused, that Jesus had the knowledge he needed from his divine intellect in his human intellect in order to do his mission. So if it wasn't relevant to his mission, he didn't have that information in his human intellect. That's why he can say things like when he's talking about the destruction of the temple, no man knows the day or the hour, not even the angels of heaven or the sun. He doesn't have that information in his human intellect because he wasn't sent to reveal when the, exactly the temple is going to be destroyed. That wasn't part of the mission. Okay, I can yeah. see that. Um, and so here, 
this actually is uh, so this is fairly theologically sophisticated scene i don't know that uh, they meant it to be but it it works i mean jesus needs to speak aramaic for his mission so he's got aramaic downloaded into his human intellect and now he's confronted with a new challenge this guy is speaking an unknown language this is a crucial moment he's wondering could this guy be an angel from my father and so he he reaches up into the divine intellect to figure out what language is this and how can i speak it and he downloads on the spot how to speak english which you know i i don't know that that's what would really happen um and it depends on which theological opinions you believe but i just think that's a cool interesting way of addressing this yeah, so my thought is, um, I think that's a good explanation of what's going on here. And like you say, I don't think that was intentional. So whatever they did seemed to like possibly work. But to me, like if it was sort of mission-based, the information that Jesus had, this would be part of the mission. This would not be something that, that God would have overlooked. It's not as yeah. if someone invents yeah. time travel and surprises God. Oh, they, they oh, what are they doing? You know, it's not, that's not what would happen. So this would be part of the mission. Right. Yeah. This would be understood from God, from the creation of the universe. And so this would be already have been downloaded. Like Jesus would have just been able to speak English with this person immediately. That's well, that would be that my, it, my problem with the, that is, the way that, that they, is, they did this. That assumes that he has the knowledge from the beginning in his human intellect, as opposed to he gets the information he needs in a just in time manner, mm -hmm. um, which would mean that he as things become relevant to his mission, like in this new timeline that's just been created, okay, now it's relevant to his mission, so now he gets the information. At least that's, I, I can see that as being a defensible opinion that one yeah. could have about what's going on here. Yeah. Now, what I, I like, still, uh -huh. I was just going to say, I would still like the, the way that he kind of like closes his eyes and gets like a matrix style download, like, you know, mm -hmm. starts to, kind of shake his eyes a little bit and then he opens them and now he knows English like that. That to me is, is, uh, the unrealistic park. Like it, it would just seem like it, it could, it could happen instantaneously. You just immediately know what's going mm -hmm. on. It doesn't have to be this, uh, but, but I get it. It's like that, that's part of what they're trying to do with the storytelling. Right. Mm -hmm. But the, and, theologically, and I think it just seems mm -hmm. weird. I, I actually, you know, I don't think it's theologically precise. I think we're into wild fantasy land here, but right. But I actually liked it as a as a dramatic technique of illustrating what's happening. Mm -hmm. I also, yeah, I mean, really, if anything, it's fun. Like this is one of the the coolest parts of the movie to me. Yeah, this is where the movie really got interesting for me, and part of why it gets interesting is because of Simon. You know, he's already. This is where I think the actor is well cast for this part because of things that he needs to do in this scene and elsewhere. He needs to have a mix of comedy and seriousness mm -hmm. and naivete and he pulls off all three of those he's already done one little comedy bit with when jesus speaks aramaic to him he says uh no speak o greco um but just even in his body mannerisms what he's going to do as soon as he learns who jesus is is awesome mm -hmm. what you speak english are you jesus it is I. <laughs> what is your... Okay, like, I love this that. Guy... He's, he's, he puts his hands together and starts bowing in a kind of oriental <laughs> style. And then he, he stretches his hands out and he's not sure what to do with them. So he kind of tries like... a couple different positions. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that, that's not bad. I, I didn't really pick up on that. But he... I don't know. It, it it still seems kind of cheesy to me, and, and I oh, also feel like, and I also I also feel like Simon like he he should be he has no scientific qualities at all like no. throughout the film, and that that's another thing like he could have been uh you know so, somewhat autistic kind of character mm -hmm. is still funny but like not really knowing that he's funny I don't know maybe that's, that's how they do it on Big Bang yeah they have yeah that's a lot what of I, the characters displaying traits of autism. Yeah, but he just seems like just a regular guy, you know. Yeah. But oh, but the I, thing I was going to mention is it it's not it's not clear if he's a Christian in this scene, no. right? It, it's not really clear throughout the movie whether or not these scientists are Christians other than um, Amy. Amy. Amy is the Amy. one who we were all told at the very beginning she's yeah. she's the Christian of the group. My, uh, but my him like he, the way that he reacts is is unclear. 
Yeah, my read on that is, so Amy is a clear Christian, as is Brant, although he's alienated from God right now. Um, Ram is a non-believer who may be Jewish based on his name, um, and he's going to eventually warm up to Christianity. Uh, Felix and Simon seem to kind of be nominal Christians, but they're not really explicit about it. But they both seem more open, you know, like Felix, when he sees the nightmare future, it's like, well, you killed Jesus. So this is a world without forgiveness. That's the kind of thing that a Christian might say. Mm -hmm. And, um, and Simon is open to Jesus and gets more and more impressed with Jesus as things go along. Yeah. He, it almost seems like more consistent with his character would be something like a nominal Christian who yeah. attends every now and then and. Yeah, Easter as Christmas kind as, of thing. as we'll hear, he hasn't even watched the whole Passion of the Christ. But <laughs> this is this is where the, his I think he works as an actor with this part because he needs to be this naive guy, and it is cheesy. You know the way he's bowing to Jesus that's totally cheesy, but I think it's also funny. That was and that was kind of the first thing I really laughed at. Purpose, uh, I think I'm here to save you. Listen. If you go back to your camp, men will come and shoot you. You know what shooting? Shoot. I'm sorry, Jesus. What you describe cannot be so. It's a lot better than the other way. Listen, a mob comes and they take you. And then they beat you and then they whip you. And then they nail spikes to your hands and feet and they hang you on a cross. It ain't pretty. How do you know all these things? Well, uh, I'm from the future, and I've seen your movie. We got it on bootleg. Forgive me, Lord, I'm sorry. <laughs> but, uh, they mess you up pretty bad. Yeah, like, he doesn't know how to how to ask for forgiveness. He's like... Yeah, <laughs> I, I, I like that. I mean, he's... So here we see a side of, of Simon where he's trying to be serious, and he's doing an okay job of it. You know, he's trying to... He's he's not a, a, like a super committed Christian who would be, you must go to the cross. He's actually saying it, it's... it Having these guys shoot you is going to be better than what they're going to do to you. So it sounds like he's a kind of nominal Christian or at least comes from a Christian culture, but he's not a mm -hmm. super believer himself. And he's trying to warn Jesus away from all this. And then I love that, you know, th this is clearly the passion of the Christ they're talking about as a later quote will make clear. Um, but he says, you know, I, how do you know all this? Well, I'm from the future and I watched your movie that I, first time I saw that I laughed out loud. And then I love how he adds, I watch it on bootleg. Oh, forgive me, Lord. You know, <laughs> that's just, that's a human reaction. That's what a lot yeah. of people who've watched bootleg movies would do in this situation. Um, and, and, and this scene with its combination of seriousness and comedy was really where the movie turned for me and started to get more interesting. Mm -hmm. I also like the fact that like Jesus's reactions, uh, seem, seem fairly in character. Like he's just mm -hmm. like, I don't really care about the, the bootleg thing, but he's, <laughs> Yeah, I, I I actually did like that. The even though the the uh, the actor that they've got for Jesus here, I'm not I'm not really the biggest fan yeah, of. Yeah, but I think that he's they pretty flat. they wrote his I think they wrote his lines uh, decent, you know. So uh, yeah, let's let's uh, keep going. And what of my disciples? Well, if they don't get slaughtered by the assassins, then I think Peter gets crucified upside down. <sighs> Father, please don't let this be. If it is already so, you can still change things for the sake of one. You are the creator of all time. You can change whatever you desire. Please grant me this. Allow Peter to live. Can you pause it there? So this is where I have more of a problem because all of our early Christian sources indicate, yeah, Peter was crucified, probably upside down. And that seems to be hinted at at the end of John's gospel, although I actually think John's gospel was written before the event happened. But this is where it doesn't make any sense to me 
the why you know in the gospels jesus tells peter one day you were going to follow me into martyrdom you know and so jesus already knew that why would jesus be praying that peter doesn't get martyred here um so this is where it doesn't really make sense to me but as an artistic representation i can accept it and i like I thought it was interesting that Simon even knew about this because most Christians don't know about Peter being crucified upside down. So what mm. that shows is the the writer, the script writer, is intellectually engaged with this material. You know, he's thinking about this stuff. He knows this stuff. He, he, he didn't just make that up. That's a real element of Christian tradition. Um, so I like that, but then I like how Simon is now, because he's not a super educated guy religiously, is going to try to give Jesus a little ray of hope here. Mm -hmm. One thing that I would have liked to see from Jesus here is, you know, in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, I don't know the exact verse in the Passion Narratives, but it, it comes up, he says, you know, Father, if possible, take this cup from me, but nevertheless, your will be done. I'd like to see yeah. that sort of sentiment expressed mm -hmm. here about Peter as well. I'd like to see him say, you know, Please let Peter survive this, but your will be done. You know, that, yeah, that I would, would have liked to see that that type of sentiment here. That would have been more uh, consistent with the character that we see in the Gospels. Don't get bummed out, all right? I, I might be wrong about the whole Peter thing. I kind of turn off your movie when your flesh starts flying around and sticking to stuff. What else do you know of me in your future? The book that you wrote, the Bible, is the most read book in history. I mean, you, you have millions of believers. Praise you, Father. Thank you for sharing this with me. Your words are encouraging. You have given me strength. Gotcha. I must now lay down my life for the sins of this world. Hold on, what? That's not even close to what I said, man. I'm trying to help you escape. If there was another way, I would welcome it. But there is not. God, this this actor, this Jesus actor, he he's almost like a, uh, a an actor that would portray Jesus in like a church play. That's mm -hmm. the yep. level of of actor that I've that I'm receiving from him. This is the download a common, that I'm getting. Yeah, this <laughs> is a common problem with religious films and with characters in religious films um when they're trying to play somebody really holy they often they don't realize the diversity of of how holiness expresses itself and yeah, how they just want to go you know, solemn yeah it, like augustine and jerome had two completely different personalities but they were both very holy um instead they tend to think of the super holy people as very stiff and monotone kind of like they're mm. walking icons or walking pious statues i've noted for years that you know if you watch the cecil b demille's the ten commandments charlton heston loses his ability to act as soon as he sees the burning bush you know before that he he can he can has a little more range but once he sees the burning bush and gets his mission from god he becomes a walking statue basically mm -hmm. and that's that's what we have here yeah that's that's a interesting point about that people don't really know how to act holy i feel like jim caviezel pulled it off though mhm mm yeah uh i think we've got another two well, one minute on this clip We doing some line reading, okay. Simon, if I do not give my life, you will die and never be with me in heaven. See, that's that's one thing with, with this clip mm -hmm. here. Simon, like if I were Simon, I'd be acting a lot differently than he would, mm -hmm. especially if I just witnessed Jesus look up speaking Aramaic at first and then looking up and, you know, getting a download and then, and then all of a sudden he can speak English. And then you're just like, you know, talking to him like he's just another dude. Um, yeah. That's the thing is Simon is not really a genius. He's just a dude yeah. and he's reacting to Jesus. Like he's just a dude. Yeah. Yeah. Which is inconsistent with the way that they set it up. He's just this brilliant guy. You know, you saw that you'd be like, uh, okay, everything, this changes everything. Like, Tell me exactly what to do, Jesus. I'll do anything. Um, 
All right. I I do like well, Jesus though. Say, I do like Jesus though saying, "If I don't die, you won't be able to be with me in heaven." That's touching. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's your life. No, 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 Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Hey, it's a joke, Jesus. Don't do it. I'm just joking with you. Thank you for helping me tomorrow. Seriously, man. Don't do this to yourself. <laughs> Look, giving away your life is one thing, but knowing that they're about to put the hurt on you, there's got to be another way to save the world. It's, it's just got to be, man. I know what is going to happen to me. And if you had finished my movie, you would know that I'll be back. I'll be back. That ain't even your movie. <laughs> so there, there, there we go. Um, yeah. You know, not not only do we have confirmation because he talks about how your flesh was coming off. Okay, that's the Passion of the Christ. But, you know, I'll be back is, you know, the line that Arnold Schwarzenegger gives in uh, the police station in the ter- first Terminator movie. Mm-hmm. And it's iconic, you know, I'll be back. And so in a time travel movie, it makes sense to have Jesus apparently as part of the download. He got he got knowledge of 20th century film culture. And so Jesus is making a riff on the Terminator and uh and simon picks up on it and they hang up they hang a, a a lampshade on it so that yep we are definitely making a reference to the terminator yeah oh so, so some people are pointing out in the comments that like yeah this this movie is kind of like brilliant in some ways and then just mm-hmm. terrible in all sorts of other ways yeah that, that that was our impression like there's a lot of it that especially at the beginning well, we were talking about like the acting is just really bad and um the, the voiceover is really bad and, and you're just like this is gonna be a, a chore to get through. But then the story is like, as I say, like just a third of the, of the movie, you, you, you see Jesus killed by the special ops team and you're like, okay, what are they going to do for the rest of the film? Like what, what's going on here? Um, and, and yeah, it's just, uh, the, the story was way more complex and different than, than what either of us were expecting. Once, once Jesus was killed, I thought we were going to get a long explanation of the nightmare future, you know, and they would, and we'd have an extended period. The middle act of the film would be the nightmare future. And then the final act would be putting everything right. But they give us almost nothing. They just give us a glance, a glimpse of the nightmare uh-huh. future. And really where the character is going to go is back to the future Two, Because in back to the future Two, Marty McFly has to go back to 1955 and reinteract in a kind of behind the scenes way with the events we've already seen play out. And so that's what that's what the middle act of this movie is, is, you know, the time travel team went back and killed Jesus prematurely. So act two is our heroes have to go back and save Jesus. And so it's it's like Back to the Future Part Two. We revisit the same scenes with new characters injected into them and see what happens. And this is where the movie gets really creative. Yeah, and then this next scene is where we're going to see them start to to try to include elements that I was mentioning earlier that are similar to the Noah movie with Russell Crowe, where they're mm-hmm. adding in these creative elements that sort of explain some of the things that we see in the Gospels almost naturalistically. But mm-hmm. uh, so like in the Noah film, they have the Elohim, which are basically these monster looking things, and they go and they help Noah build the ark. And that's supposed to be the sort of like explanation of how he's able to get it done and everything. And they try to do it in this creative way and everything. And then here we're going to see, let me just go ahead and play this clip of, uh, of Ram, the main character, how he becomes uh, one of the characters he's, portrayed in the Gospels. He's trying to get a gun back from a Roman soldier. Okay, so so Ram is now revealed to be the man who ran away naked, the young man who ran away naked uh, from the from the Gospel of Mark. Um, there's been a lot of speculation about who that was. A lot of people in, re- in just in the last few centuries have proposed it's Mark himself that he's making a cameo in his own gospel. 
That's probably not the case, though. There's a better case to be made that it was actually Lazarus. Um, having said that, uh, here it's Ram. And so he's he's got this shirt on that looks like a, to the linen garment that the young man would have been wearing. And that comes off and they do leave him with underwear for the sake of modesty. But but this is the first time we have one of our heroes ending up as a uh, as a character in the Gospels. And it's not going to be the only time they're going to do this repeatedly. Yes. Yep. So uh, this next clip is where uh, basically another instance of of that and. This is where the uh, Jesus is carrying the cross to uh, the, what is it, Golgotha? Golgotha, carrying, yeah. Golgotha, yeah, he's carrying the cross here. Um, and, and this is actually a good shot. You can see the terrible quality of these costumes. You can't really, I guess, see it with the, how kind of blurry and not HD this uh, this YouTube upload is. But um, yeah, it's just, it's it's pretty bad. It looks like they literally bought it on Amazon and just threw it together. Why? Why you find yourself do this? Just stay down, okay? I, I can't. I have to finish this. I must finish. Hey, oh, hey stop hitting him! Come on, man. Yeah, and then that that whip in the back like that looks mm-hmm. like they just took a stick from the woods and then threw yeah. some pieces of leather on it yeah, yeah the, the props and stuff they, they could have spent some more time on that my daughter literally my daughter has better props in her place <laughs> come on man. i got you all right I got you. I did. I did actually want to Come back on, up and kind of point out this this guy in the back, the old man in the back. His reactions are not genuine at all. Like, ooh, as he's standing, like it just, yeah. The background actors are even bad. <laughs> I got you. This would be very difficult to do. Mm-hmm. To pick that up, and while you're holding someone who like can't really stand up, th- not just like it, 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 like in real life, but in in the acting scene like this, that would have been heavy. So this mm-hmm. is actually pretty pretty impressive, just from like a a logistics standpoint. Mm-hmm. So, uh, how much more time we got the, on this one? I think that's about the end of it. But what I yeah. love about this is Simon is now Simon of Cyrene. You know, our our lovable yeah. goofball non-scientist from the future is now Simon of Cyrene from the Gospels, the man who helped Jesus carry the cross. Um, and I just, I love that. Now, when I saw this, my first thought was, oh, he's going to be stuck in the past. Because in Mark's Gospel, when um, when Simon of Cyrene shows up, Mark introduces him to the audience by saying he's the father of Alexander and Rufus which means that Simon had two sons, Alexander and Rufus, that were known to the audience of Mark's gospel in Rome. So he had children. And so I'm thinking, also, Simon is not really from Cyrene. He's from North America. Cyrene is in Libya. Um, so uh, so he, he... he He's not. He doesn't really match with Simon of Cyrene, but I'm thinking, oh no, Simon's going to get stuck in the past and become a father. But I don't think the scriptwriter either knew enough about Simon of Cyrene, or if he just didn't care and wanted to do this for literary purposes. But I thought because he doesn't get stuck in the past, he goes back to the future. That would have um, been cool if he got stuck. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, someone in the comments is saying he's an NPC. <clears throat> the guy in the background that I was pointing out that was just kind of like uh-huh. acting. He's an NPC from Minecraft. Someone says oh, in the comment. In the comment. <laughs> I'm familiar with in NPC, but I think they probably mean the same thing. Yes, I think they meant NPC. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, next clip is another instance. <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, another instance of what we've been talking about, where these characters are now, uh, yeah, you know, real life characters. So this is after Amy has been shot, and uh, Brant, you know, he he shot Jesus in the original timeline, but here they've saved Jesus. So Jesus does go to the cross on schedule. Um, you also need to know that there's another. Uh, um, what is his name? It's like Sabir, I think is his name, was like the other security leader who also mm -hmm. came back in time with Brant on the yes. original Jesus mission. So you need to yes. know, you need to bear in mind Brant and Sabir. And so this is the crucifixion scene, and then they've got, Ram has got Amy here. Because she's been Jesus. shot. Well, if you're who you say you are, then please heal her. Yeah, the, I mean, the, the acting here, I mean, th this could be so, so much better. Mm -hmm. You're in love with this person. She's dying in front of you. You're in front of Jesus on the cross. Like you would, the emotions that would be happening in this moment would just be overwhelming. And yeah, he what sounds, we're getting here is. He sounds like a whiny kid. Yeah. It would do it. Just heal her. She risked yeah. Her and then Jesus right? on the cross is just like chilling. You're just like, mm. it, the, the acting could be so much better. Mm -hmm. And such a, it, this would be such an emotional scene if it was done uh, correctly. Do you. Mm -hmm. you even understand what I'm saying? You're wasting your time. Sabir. He can't even save himself. And there's Brant over there. Yep. We deserve this fate. <laughs> yeah, what, one historical inaccuracy, inaccuracy as well is I always look whenever people are depicting the crucifixion scenes, I always look to see if it's in the hand or if it's in the wrist. If mm -hmm. it's in the hand, it's usually that's probably not the way that they did it. It was more than likely in the wrist so that they could actually hold them up with that. Because if it was in the hand... I mean, you know, they do mention that sometimes that they would wrap their arms around with mm -hmm. the leather straps or whatever to, to help keep them up. But even still, like it would it would just rip through the cartilage in the hand. It it would it would be ambiguous. Uh, they could do it both ways. But if they did it through the palm, then they did tend to tie the wrists. So to take the weight off of the palm itself. Mm -hmm. yeah. He's done nothing wrong. Oh, r r remind me. I, uh, mm -hmm. This I'll, I'll talk about this in a second. What he just did, but remind me, how did they get captured? How did they get uh, in this well, position? I, there, I it was it was in an earlier scene in the marketplace because they were going to try to ambush Jesus, and they lost their time travel devices, so they couldn't blink out. But they were planning an assault, and the Romans picked up on it, so they got. Um, they got arrested in that circumstance. Now it doesn't quite fit, although I guess maybe it's kind of it kind of could fit with what the the gospels say about the two individuals. It uses the word uh, "less thy" for them, which means like bandit or insurrectionist, because bandits and insurrectionists tended to be the same thing. Um, they weren't just thieves the there is an mm -hmm. like an armed element to to banditry or insurrection and um and and they may have actually been colleagues of barabbas um who was said to have been in a in a previous insurrection and it uses the same word uh less thos for him um but then he gets released and these two guys may have been his buddies in real life um what what they're doing here is they well they were planning an attack and i guess that could get construed as an insurrection um against roman authority if you're going to go try to kill jesus while he's in roman custody um but i just love the fact that sabir and brant end up as the good thief and the bad thief i think that's awesome so i'm noticing some people in the comments saying that they lost us for a little while uh, oh, no. which is unfortunate and it looks like some people were suggesting that it was reported maybe too much copyright material so i'm not sure but it looks like the people uh, in the recent comments are saying that it were back so 
Um, guys, let me know in the live chat if everything looks good. If not, everything is being recorded on the back end. So if it was missing on YouTube and it's not there, then I can just re-upload everything uh, later on. So yeah, and like I said, hopefully what we're doing, we're pausing these clips frequently enough so that it's going to classify, be classified as commentary and fall under fair use. So yep. um, hopefully we don't run into any of those issues, but yeah, just let us know if it, everything it can, looks, it can sometimes okay. take time to get those issues navigated, but we are being within fair use here. Okay. Yeah. And some, okay. Someone said that it said policy violations. Uh, now it's saying mm. we're back. So yeah, hopefully uh, the whole video is there, but like I said, if not, then we can just re-upload. So um, no big deal. All right. So um, I'm not sure what, what people miss, but what we're doing is we're looking at a clip of uh, Ram who is the main character begging for the love of his life, Amy's life. She was shot. Uh, he's in front of uh, Jesus on the cross. And then Sabir and Brant, they are these uh, these two... Uh, the good and bad what thieves. Are they called? The good and bad thieves on the cross. But what are, what are their actual roles in the film? They are... Um, security guys secu for Ahmed. Security guards for the, the main bad character. Um, but then they get wrapped up in the whole story and then they become the two thieves on the cross. And so that's what we're kind of looking at here with this clip. So we've just been commentating on, uh, especially at the beginning with Ram begging for his, uh, for Amy's life. Like his, his emotions were just not there. It was, it was just really, really bad acting, but let, let's uh, keep playing this clip now that we've got people back. He's dying just like us. He's nothing but a criminal. Okay, real quick, I'm, I'm reading more of the comments and people are saying that they lost us after we showed Ram with uh, with Amy in front of the cross. Yeah, so as I just explained, um, and maybe you got, if you guys that are watching live missed it, Sabir and Brant got into this position on the cross because they were, well, Jimmy, tell, tell me one more time, they were they trying were, to ambush Jesus in the market. Right, yeah, and the Romans got wind of the plot. And then they got wrapped up in the, in the crucifixion. Then they were, here they are on the cross. Jesus. Please forgive me. Oh, I was going to mention it. It looks like Brant is actually like raising himself up to breathe, mm -hmm. which is another thing that's really important historically for crucifixion victims is that the main yes. way that they were uh, that they were killed on the cross was through asphyxiation. So they had to push themselves up in order to take a breath. And each time they did that, it caused immense pain, especially uh, depending on where they put the the nail in the foot, because sometimes it would just go through the cartilage. Sometimes it would literally go through the bone. So imagine trying to push yourself up off of your foot that has a, a nail through the bone and you're trying to take a breath and like that would just over time it just becomes excruciatingly painful to where you just die of asphyxiation and so when Brant you see him on the cross he's trying to kind of push his, his chest up it looks like he's trying to take a breath and that's another historical accuracy that I think is worth pointing out. That's also why they wanted to break their legs in the Gospels, because if you break the legs, then they can't push themselves up and they'll die quicker. They'll just suffocate. They, and they, they, they didn't breathe. want them to still be on the cross overnight, so they wanted to break their legs. Mm -hmm. Remember me. Dude, and then Brant is just ripped. Like, those are some <laughs> abs right there. Just mm -hmm. ripped. Which I guess when you're like you don't have a family, you just can work out all the time. Maybe maybe he was working out to to kind of numb the pain, but ripped. When you enter your kingdom, <laughs> you will be with me in paradise. He tried to kill you! And me! He shot Amy! If you were God, wouldn't you know that? And now you're forgiving him! Your forgiveness means nothing! Prove that you're God! Come down off that cross and heal Amy! You're supposed to be a genius. And you're asking him for help. Shut up, Sabir! Please! 
Please save her. God, that acting is so cringy. I can't even yep. watch it. <laughs> Please. Please. In what would otherwise be a very, you know, very touching moment. Like just mm -hmm. the emotions that would actually be part of this scene, this dialogue would just be insane. To see a good actor in this situation, mm -hmm. be, it'd be it'd be pretty crazy. Mm -hmm. Pretty pretty cool. So that's that's what that's where the the story in this could actually be it could make the whole thing just really interesting. Yeah. But then the it falls flat with the with the bad acting. Well, like for example in this he, in this the actor portraying ram is going really broad you know he's he's super whiny he's got this really big please please you know and actually this is one of those instances where like if you want people to listen you lower your voice rather than raising it and it would be so much more powerful if he had a little bit of a peak and then started pulling it back in despair. Just please, please, you know, that would be a lot better than just constant two-year-old shrieking. <laughs> yes. Yes. And I, I emphasize that with my daughter too. I'll like work with her on her on her lines. And I'm like, you've got to put yourself in the position of like, this is your character. This is what you would actually be feeling in this moment. How would you react? How would you actually feel? And it doesn't seem like this actor is, is doing that. It seems like he's just trying to act. He's just trying to think of like how someone would be in that situation as opposed to like putting himself into that situation because everybody can, everyone feels emotions and stuff, unless you're David Wood and you're, you're a psychopath and you don't have emotions. Um, but if you do have emotions, you know what it's like to, to feel lost and to feel desperate and, and all those things. And so you want to try to put yourself in that situation. Um, I know you guys aren't trying to take acting lessons from me that I'm not even an actor myself, but um, nevertheless, it, it, I think it, it, it could have just been so, so much better. <laughs> You're nothing but a fraud. And now she's going to die because of you. Yeah, and this is where the pivotal line is uh, delivered here. Yep. To save well, Amy, you must forgive Brad. I'll never forgive him. Or you. So there we've got the belly of the beast, the darkest moment in the story, where our hero is saying, I'm never going to forgive Brant and I'm never going to forgive you, Jesus, mm -hmm. which is, uh, which is interesting that they'd go there in a Christian movie to have him actually say that to Jesus's face. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, I it mean, just doesn't... I can imagine people saying that when they're praying in a Christian movie, but most mm -hmm. Christian movies don't involve time travel. And here he gets to say it to Jesus's face. Yeah, way more that could be said about this scene and how how good it actually could have been, and mm -hmm. uh, just just wasn't. But let's let's move on to the next clip. One twenty one oh three. Set set this one up for us. Uh, so this is in Jesus's tomb, and Ahmed, the boss terrorist guy, has come back in time uh, to Jesus's tomb. He's dropped some glow sticks around the tomb, which is why there is a green glow in it. And he's going to take some of Jesus's DNA just before the resurrection happens. I really would have liked to have killed you myself. No need for concern. Just getting a little DNA for my lab. So that's more of that exposition where he's explaining. I mean, and he wouldn't be talking to a dead person. In well, like a real story, does, you know, you know, maybe sometimes <clears throat> I've, I've talked to dead people. I mean, to their bodies. Yeah. Yeah. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I think we've got a little bit more in this clip. But, but he is a real mustache twirl. Yes, he is a, a, a kind of a mustache twirling villain. I would have wanted to kill you myself. Yeah. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and yeah, there is more to the clip. Hey, 
So Amy's still alive. That's gotta be it. Yes. Which is remarkable. I mean, it, I, I guess it kind of makes up. sense. Hey, we're depending here. on where she was shot. That's it. Look at these outfits. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Just I like the Hershey amazing. Kiss helmets they have. <laughs> <laughs> they literally they literally hired a team of high schoolers to to make these. I mean, high schoolers could have done better. Yeah. I don't know. It's, it's you're right. Just, you're right. Incidentally, that Amy is taking a long time to die, but that's reasonable because she's gut shot, right. and gut gut shots are famous for taking forever to kill you. They're not like head yeah. shots or heart shots. Yeah, um, and days. she, and as she's weakening, she asked them to bring her here so she could see the resurrection, which mm -hmm. we're about to. <laughs> Like a time transfer. I wonder if I... you're alive. Go check it out. Yeah. Yeah. So this is completely different than the Gospels. In in uh, in Mark, Luke, and John, when the women show up at the tomb, the stone is already moved, and and that they don't ever address how it got moved. In Matthew's version, Matthew clarifies that an angel came down and rolled the stone away, um, not to let Jesus out, but to let the witnesses in. Jesus had already gone. He apparently did a locked room escape, you know, just like when he comes and visits the disciples in John, even though they've got the doors locked because they're afraid, Jesus just teleports in, and he apparently teleported out of the tomb in real life. But here, the resurrection is so powerful it shatters the stone <laughs> like blows it away yeah and uh and even though it's not uh biblically realistic i like the enthusiasm of that yeah so so amy then tells them uh tells uh simon and 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 ram to go down and check out the tomb which kind of leads to our next clip Uh, be careful, you might be changing history. Gone. Not here. He has risen. Yes. So Simon and, and, and Ram end up being the two young men or the two, two angels in the tomb. And even though mm -hmm. they only speak English, by gesturing with the glow sticks, they're able to communicate the essential idea. Yep. Great, great scene there. Uh, <laughs> okay, so uh, the, the next clip you don't have in your notes. But, right. Uh, I was going to say you have one you wanted to do here. This is from later yeah. in the film where we get the payoff for that. You must forgive Brant line. Yes. And the reason why I'm including this one is because the acting is just that awful. It's, it's that bad guys. I need you to see it. I need you to see this. And experience yeah, now this, it. this version of Brant has lost his family, but he hasn't yet shot Amy or killed Jesus. This is before all that in his personal timeline. Yes. Which is a, a, one of those things that is, is just um, kind of hard to follow with the movies, like who is where in what timeline and everything. And um, so it'd be helpful if we had someone like Jimmy, like while we're watching movies yeah. like this, to just sit down and explain to us, okay, this person, I, I just need a, to hire you next time to do that for me jimmy yeah sure i'm watching that's a time what travel film <laughs> that's what the voiceovers in this film are trying to do <laughs> yeah okay uh yeah so this is this is where ram forgives uh brant and yeah let's just watch this one 
please. Send me to my family. Shoot me. Please. Just do it. Do it. Do it. See, see decent acting from Brant. Like, decent. Mm -hmm. Decent. I have to do this. For me. For Amy. I... I forgive you. I, I, for, I forgive you. Mm. <laughs> yeah, so the actor playing Ram is really channeling his inner 12 year old. Hmm. It's just so, so bad. I can't even, I, it, it's like a, uh, I don't really watch soap operas, but mm -hmm. um, I've got a friend that actually plays in one, Scott Clifton. Oh, really? Uh, yeah. I used to watch him back in the 80s. Yeah, but that, that's that's almost like what the scene kind of reminds me of. Even the lighting is kind of like that. It's like very dark mm. and moody. Um, but then the acting being just bad and like they're, they're really trying to over overact and it just mm -hmm. doesn't none of it is realistic none of it is realistic i forgive you it's just yeah hmm. okay let's move on to uh to another clip uh yeah and i think this is the last i think this one. is the last one um so this is another version of there there are several versions of um of amy and ram in the movie there's one great scene which we didn't have a clip of where one version of them is has snuck back into the lab before they've at, left for the first time and they know they're being monitored and they even know that they're themselves are the younger version of themselves are watching them on the monitor and um and the um Ram is like, okay, well, we've only got a few seconds here. What are we going to do? And Amy, Amy gets a nice moment where she says, okay, genius, just watch this. And she starts signing into the camera of the security system. She just, with no warning, she's, she's fluent in sign language and she just starts signing and explaining what's going on to every, in sign language, to everyone watching the security camera, which the guards don't know sign language, but she does. So her younger self knows exactly what her older self is saying. And this gives them crucial information to help further the plot. But then because they only have a few seconds, the security breaks in and shoots the older versions of Amy and, and Ram. So that's who these characters are. They're the older versions who came back and Amy did sign language to explain the plot to their younger selves. And this is their fate. This is what happens to them. And it looks like I can't play at the exact moment. So we're going to have about 30 extra seconds. Sure. Yeah, this scene would be super confusing if you haven't watched the whole movie. Thirty years into the future, emergency entrance, Metro City Community Hospital. Yeah. Initiate in one minute. Delete all files. We transferred to the future, but we weren't the only ones. The almond that was in Jesus's tomb also transported before his timeline expired. He brought Jesus's DNA with him. Well, he was able to clone Jesus. Now this new Jesus can raise the dead, levitate objects, manipulate the weather, change molecular structures, and more. Only one big problem. He's quite the opposite of Jesus. That must be why they call him the Antichrist. Oh, no. <laughs> 
So I, I like what I like about this is that they 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 go to the future and they're genuinely except for Felix who just gets left in a nightmare zombie future. They they are trying to tie up. The different and we all suppose he just died, right? He, he yeah, died from yeah. zombie bite. Yeah, but they're they're trying to tie up these loose ends and they're trying to be creative with it. And so this version of Amy and and Ram get to go 30 years into the future. They're in 2059 and they tie up the the DNA uh, thread with 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 Ahmed and he's done what loads of people ask about you know since a, a few years ago since we developed you know DNA technology and the potential ability to clone humans people have said oh could we get Jesus's blood off off the shroud of Turin and clone him and would would the clone have miraculous powers and stuff and I get this question not all the time but f- fairly frequently in my apologetic work Really? And, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Well, I also I make a point of answering of taking every question seriously. So people are comfortable asking me weird questions. And this is one that comes up periodically. Um the answer would be we'd have trouble uh at least with present technology even assuming the shroud of Turin it was the burial cloth of Jesus. If you assume that uh, there's going to be a lot of DNA contamination from it being handled over the last 2,000 years. And so figuring out whose DNA is Jesus's versus somebody else's would be a challenge. It would be one that's potentially overcomable, but it would be a challenge. Um, then if you actually did the cloning, which is immoral because you can't morally clone a human being, the clone would not have miraculous powers, meaning ones that are above human nature not supernatural. Um, It's possible, hypothetically, if you think psychic functioning exists, that some psychic functioning may have a genetic basis. And if Jesus had like an unfallen genetic code, he might have extra psychic functioning compared to a normal human. But DNA itself will not give you miraculous supernatural abilities. Um, so he, so a clone of Jesus would be a fully normal human with maybe some unfallen traits like a, a holier personality since he doesn't have temptation in the same way or might not have temptation in the same way, or he might have a little extra psychic ability if you believe that's real, but he wouldn't just have the full on suite of miraculous abilities that the divine, human Jesus had because you need that divine nature to really do stuff, Your gene, to do stuff miraculous. Your genes won't do it for you. Okay, so I just got an email, mm-hmm. a very interesting email from YouTube saying that this video has been deleted. It's no longer available. So oh, no. uh, the, uh, the it, we're still recording and everything. So people that are watching this later, um, you'll you'll be able to see this, but it's saying we've detected content on your live stream that may belong to somebody else and was not corrected following repeated warnings of possible abuse. You may not have intended to include this content, but live streams should be actively monitored by the channel owner, and any potential issues should be corrected in a timely manner. Um, yeah, which I, I, I'm not sure what that means. What sort of abuse? Maybe maybe just copyright. Well, yeah, that's what they're thinking of. Um, third third party content policy. Yeah. yeah. So what we may need to do here is uh, is let the producers of the film know about this and get their consent to show them, yeah, we're doing this as fair use. You know, we're providing limited snippets in a much longer piece that is devoted to um, to film criticism, which is one mm-hmm. of the things you're allowed to do. And we're giving them free publicity and we're trying right. to, we're, we're not just savaging their movie. We're talking about its good points that would encourage more people to go see their movie. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Um, well, I think what we'll do is we'll go ahead and just wrap things up regardless, especially for the the audience that is still watching this or not, not the live audience. There is no more live audience, but uh, the people it's that are watching this after the fact are watching us. It's, that's what it says, but it, it's. I just got that email that says it was mm. it was deleted. So, um, and we haven't received any more live chats. So, that's mm. that's got to be what's what's going on. But um, overall, I mean, I I uh, actually enjoyed this this exercise. Mm-hmm. It was um, again the movie surprised me. Like I was I was expecting it to just be you know cringe story, cringe acting, and I think the acting pretty much lived up to my expectations. the The costumes were below my expectations. The locations were above my expectations. 
Um, but the story, I think, is what really got really su uh, surpassed my expectations, even though there's there's things that you could quibble with and things that you could say, OK, they could have improved here and here. Um, other, it was it was nevertheless a, an interesting story. So I got to give it that. Yeah, I would agree. I think the plot surpassed my expectations. It was clear that the author was actually intellectually engaging with the material and he was trying to be creative and he was creative. Um, it's definitely the weirdest Christian movie I've ever seen. And I'm sure it's the weirdest Christian movie ever made um, because it is fundamentally trying to have a faith building message. You know, and just like at the end of the romance novel, you know, all the, the two main characters are going to get together. Well, at the end of a Christian film, you know, everyone except the bad guy is going to have their faith strengthened. And that happens here. Um, so, you know, it had some amateurish aspects, but I was surprised. I'd far from thinking it's the worst Christian movie ever made. I think it's just the weirdest. And it, if you can go with the premise then you might be interested in watching the movie because yeah. it has some <clears throat> redeeming aspects. All right, let's uh, let's do this as we close things out, as we wrap things up with this this video. Let me know if you guys would like to see another movie review of a Christian movie. It doesn't have to be a Christian movie, but another movie review in general with Jimmy, uh, this sort of level of a breakdown. And uh, what we may have to do in the, the future reviews is just play less clips from the movies so that we don't get in, into yeah. too much trouble. Maybe we can just put up some screenshots and then comment on like the scene of what's going on. Something along those lines might be a little bit uh, less potential for being Algor just taken, algorithm taken down, yeah. yes 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 but in any case jimmy thanks for uh for coming back on thanks for spending the time to watch that movie um i'm, I'm really glad that it was uh it was better than we were expecting so mm -hmm. wasn't a complete waste of time yeah well thank you very much for having me and i know we're still in the easter season folks so everybody happy easter and if black easter is your thing happy black easter too wow there you go. All right. We'll see you guys later. Hey, it's me again. Uh, actually, don't leave yet. I've got something super, super important to tell you. So first of all, you're awesome. Like you, you just watched a really, really long video just now and you're still watching it. That is actually pretty amazing. Secondly, we have hundreds, literally hundreds of other apologetics related videos for you to watch on our channel. Go check them out. I've interviewed exorcists, hosted debates between Christians and atheists. I've even made response videos to atheists. All of that is available on our channel. Go check it out. Third, I rely on people that see value in my work, people like you that watch videos to the very end to keep the lights on around here. Literally, this is how I feed my family. So if you see value in the work that I do, please consider supporting this ministry and becoming a patron. Links to that are in the description. Oh, and uh, have I mentioned that Christianity is true?